Okay, let's begin. We're still waiting for two participants to uh, complete the registration process, and they'll be here shortly, but it's important to begin because we don't have a great deal of time. My name is Carol Leonard. Welcome. Uh, tremendously exciting uh, program we have today with uh, the world's experts, uh, including um, uh, the director of the Institute of Russian History, Yuri Petrov, who will provide the introduction to this session. I briefly just simply uh, wanted to say on behalf of the Academy um, that uh, we're, we're very, very pleased <coughs> about the participants uh, who include um, the world's major experts on the Russian Revolution and also Branko Milanovic, um, who from CUNY, who will speak later about uh, some of the larger questions as well as George Lawson from the LSE, uh, who will speak also about larger questions addressed to revolution in the 19th century. Um, and so just to introduce you, um, Dan Orlovsky from S SMU, he's written um, a great deal about uh, the Social Revolution. He's written a long book on the limits of reform about the bureaucracy in the 19th century. And he's one of the major figures in the world of, of uh, the United States and the world of Slavics, uh, Slavic studies. Uh, Robert Service, to his left, is uh, perhaps the dean of the Russian Revolution in all of England. And he's written uh, major works, including biographies of the revolution's leader. And he's really everyone knows him. He appears on television in the United States too. And I'm awfully, uh, I mean, the, U the UK. And I'm awfully glad uh, that he came. And George Lawson, as I say, from the LSE. Uh, you're a sociologist, right? Kind of. Kind of. Oh, he's a kind Sounds of a right. sociologist. Um, okay, let me just then um, quickly read the, the, the questions with which they will deal, and then I'll turn the floor over to uh, Yuri Petrov. Did February 17 provide a model for the color revolutions in Central and Eastern Europe? Were living standards actually rising before the Russian Revolution? If so, how can discontent be explained? Can it be said that the Russian Revolution of 1917 and its outcomes built on but also destroyed 19th century concepts of revolution? To what extent does persistent inequality play a role in 20th century revolutions? What is the role of power in the process of revolution? Yuri. Thank you, Carol. Uh, first of all, let me say thanks uh, to the organizers of the GUIDAR uh, forum for this uh, quite rare uh, a rare opportunity to participate in this forum, and uh, no doubt it is uh, uh, related to the fact that we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Great Russian Revolution this year. So this uh, title, the Great Russian Revolution, has been now established in um, uh, science, in the uh, uh, social opinion, uh, so we've decided to move away from the dichotomy of the uh, February and October Revolution, uh, rather than counter poisons, I think we should talk about the uh, uniform process that started in February uh, 17, ending uh, uh, actually uh, with, together with the civil war. Any kind of revolution is a, is a, a traumatic uh, uh, to uh, um, any nation. So we, uh, until today, we can see traces. Um, uh, the footprint of this trauma, of this great trauma even today. Uh, until today, we are witnessing the polarization of views regarding this revolution. For some people, it remains a locomotive of history. For others, it is, uh, uh, is an absolute evil. So there's a range of uh, uh, quite opposing views uh, where, uh, which uh, uh, you know, actually reflects the public opinion of our country. Our task as historians is to uh, sum up the results of this uh, 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 the hundred-year period, uh, which I think is quite a sufficient time to uh, think over uh, the the uh, root causes of these events. Although it's not so much uh, uh, well, for example, talking about the French Revolution that has celebrated the 200 uh, year anniversary about 20 years ago. But even at that time, in uh, the French society, the, uh, there were different um, 
views of the French Revolution. Some people remembered uh, Fraternité, Liberté, and other slogans. Others concentrated on Van Degg, uh, uh, Jacobin's uh, dictatorship, and other evils of the French Revolution. So in other words, a revolution is always a serious uh, trauma, and the scars remain on the body of the country for quite a long time. So our task now, um, this year, 2017, would, we, we should try to sum up some results, uh, to outline the guidelines, and uh, basically, I think our uh, social mission uh, is to ensure um, the better consolidation in terms of uh, the uh, <coughs> overall um, uh, evaluation of this event um, and, and December last year there was a, a decree issued by Vladimir Putin, president of the Russian Federation related to the 100th uh, anniversary of the Russian Revolution uh, which um, actually entrusted our uh, professional community uh, specifically the Russian Historical Society was entrusted to prepare a plan of events uh, uh, setting up an organizing committee and to uh, conduct the uh, relevant events in relation to this uh, anniversary. So the uh, secretary of the Historical Society, Andrei Yevgenievich Petrov, uh, who is uh, present here uh, among this uh, audience, uh, he's actually a um, representative of this corporate organization, which is now... Uh, designing a plan of action. <coughs> so what we are going to do this year, we are going to do quite a lot, uh, publishing books, holding international conferences, and today's uh, forum, today's section is just one of the first uh, uh, events um, in a series, and I'm really delighted to say that this uh, section is now held with participation of not only Russian, but also foreign colleagues who would like to share our views on the range of issues that have been mentioned by my colleague, uh, Professor Leonard. So what we'd like to do, we would like to understand each other better, to see uh, to where the, there are similarities or maybe uh, uh, disagreements. Uh, in any way, I do hope that we have a very interesting uh, discussion today, talking about the time schedule. I would like to ask the speakers to uh, please stick to the schedule. We can allow only 10 minutes for each speaker, uh, so as um, uh, at the end of the uh, of the session, we could leave some time for a Q and A session. So after this uh, brief uh, uh, introduction, we'd like uh, now to give the floor to our experts, and the floor is given first of all to uh, Professor Daniel Orlovsky from uh, South uh, Methodist University of the United States. Please, Professor Orlovsky. delighted to be and to uh, share our ideas about the Russian Revolution and I'm going to go a little bit against the grain I'm I'm uh, a historian primarily studying the provisional government meaning the February Revolution uh, I started this uh, adopting the longer view of the revolution as a process but now I'm uh, focusing on 1917. Now, the provisional government was a central element of the February Revolution and indeed the entire revolutionary experience in Russia. And oddly, its complete history is yet to be written, uh, perhaps because of the aura of failure that has always surrounded it. Why this, why study the provisional government? Because this involved uh, power, the issue of power in the revolution. And in the year 1917, it was the state power in 1917, uh, although this was contested. And uh, we'll see that uh, terms like dual power, many powers, no powers, uh, anarchy uh, were used in 1917 to describe the situation surrounding power. The power question uh, was very dominant in 1917. Why 1917 uh, itself? I think it's important just to say a couple of words, be a little different, I'm sure, than some of my colleagues here, uh, because uh, I believe the revolution uh, 
is a special kind of event, a special process. Uh, it is uh, a situation that sets in motion rhetorical dichotomies, new old revolutionary, counter-revolutionary, new categories such as the democracy, uh, the all socialist government, self-government versus bureaucracy, and as I said, dual power versus many powers versus no powers uh, and, and, and such. Uh, revolution is a, an event with a large capital R. Uh, if I can uh, read one quotation which refers to events back in the early modern period. Uh, revolutions are moments of political effervescence which take place when the rules break down, when power is absent, and when ordinary political activity is suspended. Thus, revolutions can take the form of madness, of collective loss of reason, just like the esprit de vertigo, which according to Voltaire imbued the fronde. Far from constituting the turning point of an epic, revolution allows the emergence of essential and eternal myths of the golden age or the com coming of the kingdom of God, reviewed to fit the passions of the time, particularly in this case, religion and patriotism. So for me, 1917 is important because revolution itself becomes a historical actor. It becomes a force, a reference point, something that can't be denied, something that organizes the minds of people and uh, the actual realities of power. And you can't say that really about World War I. You can say it certainly about the post-October period, but that too has a different definition in my opinion. So what about the provisional government? Uh, many of the forms and institutions of Soviet power that came later were created by the provisional government in 1917. A whole sort of infrastructure of uh, lower level locations of power the idea of self-government, all of these were transferred into the Soviets uh, later. I also believe that the provisional government was instrumental in creating certain kinds of mixed uh, institutions, not just self-government, but mixed institutions of the state and society in education, in land reform, uh, and the nationality question, a whole host of issues that uh, were passed on to the Soviet regime institutionally, culturally, and so on. I believe that in order to properly study power in a revolution and in 1917, you have to go at it from three different levels. You have to look at the administrative activity of the provisional government, its actions as a government. You have to look at the party and ideology a dimension which infuse the government with uh, motivations, and you have to look at the social dimension. The provisional government, like the Tsarist bureaucracy and the later Soviet uh, bureaucracy, was deeply rooted in uh, Russian society, and particularly uh, a revolution, a social revolution of white collar workers of of, sluzhashi, of, of uh, middle level uh, experts and others of this sort who transcended and worked right through the revolution and helped to build the Soviet state. I'm also very interested in the end, what I call the end game, the end game of 1917. We're learning a lot more now about the beginning of the February Revolution, about conspiracies, about the role of the Duma, about the temporary committee, about Rodzyanka, about Miryukov, about rivalries, about why the provisional government was cut loose from previous institutions and gained its legitimacy from, again, quote, the revolution. But I'm interested in the end game, you know, how October happened, and not just from the Bolshevik narrative. I'm looking at the Menshevik and the provisional government side of the story, the institutions, what I called the, uh, the failed institutions in quotation marks like the Council of the Republic uh, at the very end of the provisional government, attempts to build an all-socialist government 
viable alternatives to the outcome that we had uh, in the Bolshevik uh, triumph in October 1917. I think this is very much uh, understudied. And uh, I think I will stop there in my remarks. So study the provisional government. There's a lot to learn there. Thank you very much. Yes, Bob? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here for um, uh, what has already been a very successful uh, conference. And it is a year when Russia and the rest of the world are commemorating one of the most extraordinary events in 20th century history. And it is very clear from every statement recently made that the concentration of focus is likely to be on the October Revolution. But at the time, as Dan has already indicated, the February Revolution was thought of as being a most extraordinary and exceptionally important uh, event. With the fall of Nicholas II, widely known in Russia as Nikolai Krovavi, celebrations took place not only in Petrograd, but also in Paris, in London, and in New York that at last the most feared tyrant in the whole of Europe had fallen from power, that the Tsarist system had been at last overthrown, and there was a, a prospect, it was thought, among the allied countries of uh, the end to the incubus of uh, Tsarism, meaning that a more effective war effort would be undertaken in Russia, and Russia's military might was very, very important to the whole of the Allied military project. Without the Eastern Front, then there was a danger of the Western Front collapsing before German power. So this was an extraordinarily important event in uh, world history. Uh, what it seems to me has always seemed to me uh, important in all of this is that the collapse of Tsarism accelerated and exacerbated and aggravated a number of problems that already existed in the war machine of the Russian Empire. Uh, the food supplies crisis, so far from being resolvable, was worsened by the fall of the Tsar. The priority given to military transport over civilian transport was never going to be resolved by the removal of Nikolai Vtaroy. Uh, the living conditions of workers in Petrograd and the other major industrial cities of northern and central Russia were not going to be solved by a change in the political complexion of the uh, ruling elite, so that the, the workers who had bad housing, terrible sewage, awful educational uh, opportunities, these conditions are, were only going to get worse in 1917, and add to that the refugee crisis, the number, the hundreds of thousands of refugees who came from the western borderlands to flee the Germans and the Austrians and piled into Russian cities. This was a recipe for revolutionary commotion rather than national uh, consensus. And moreover, as this happened, the lid was removed on all of the long-standing chronic resentments that existed among workers, peasants, and ex-peasants, i.e. soldiers and sailors, who at last had an opportunity to express those resentments freely and formed their own mass organizations, the Soviets, 
and the factory workshop committees. Uh, the village land commune came into its own uh, again. This was an extraordinary uh, social effervescence that was made possible by the fall of Nicholas II, but it boded ill for the prospects of the provisional uh, government that was uh, going to uh, try to deal with this. In other words, the Bolsheviks were not magical, revolutionary conjurers. They were very lucky to be able to operate at last in a situation of economic breakdown, administrative collapse, and in the summer of 1917, military defeat. This was the perfect scenario for a party that had had only a few thousand members before 1917, in some of the biggest cities, only a few hundred members at most, uh, to uh, make the advance on power. And it was going to be a new type of revolution, precisely because Russia had a generation of far-left socialists who had an, a utopian notion of what the perfect society was, communism, and furthermore firmly believed that the era had already started for that communism to be spread all over the world so that whatever the circumstances were that were so bad for Russia, those bad circumstances would enable the Bolsheviks to take power in Russia and furthermore would enable them to make alliances with fraternal parties elsewhere in Europe and North America such that all of the problems of Russia would be solved very quickly. It was a utopian notion. And the Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries warned the Bolsheviks, if you seize power, there will be civil war. You will only hold power if you organize a dictatorship. The Bolsheviks said, instead, yes, we will have a dictatorship, but it will be a proletarian <coughs> dictatorship, and it will be temporary. Their enemies pointed out to them that it was very unlikely to be temporary. Most Russians were religious believers. Most Russians did not believe that they had no right to bargain their small property for other uh, goods, even in the socialist uh, economy. Most, most Russians and other peoples had all kinds of um, notions about the good society that were not shared by Lenin and Trotsky. In those conditions then, where the communists were moving towards a state-owned economy and a state-directed, centrally-directed form of politics, it was always going to be a brutal dictatorship, especially if the lands, the outlying lands outside Russia, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, Turkestan, had to be regathered they were not going to be regathered by a democratic consensus. It was going to be a new type of revolution then. And I think we have to move away from the idea that there was something uh, that Russia was exposed to that no other country was exposed to in wartime. In those countries that went down to military defeat, there was a similar process of societal disintegration. It happened in Munich. Uh, it happened across Hungary in 1919. Russia was not unique, except in one crucial respect. The military counter-revolution in Russia was late in getting itself organized. In Bavaria and in Hungary, the military counter-revolution was immediate, it was instant. There were forces in Germany and in Hungary and in northern Italy that very readily organized themselves against the new far-left forces that sought to make 
a communist-style uh, revolution. Russia alone did not have that um, high morale among its counter-revolutionaries until such time as the Red Army had already organized itself. This, this was what was unusual about Russia. And the model of the one-party state, the terror state, the state-owned economy that Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks lurched into more or less accidentally or at least experimentally in 1917 through to 1922, this model was then copied by many countries in the third world so that about a third of the world's Earth's surface by 1960 was covered by communist style or communist states. It was an extraordinary thing to have happened. A mixture then of predetermination and of accident, of fluke. Uh, and the result of all of that was the longevity of communism until such time as it became obvious that economic competitiveness was never going to be achieved by the USSR. And Mikhail Gorbachev came to the same conclusion and launched Perestroika in the fitful, uh, uh, over-optimistic way that he did in order to uh, bring the Soviet Union back into the uh, comity of uh, nations, with the consequence that the USSR itself um, collapsed. But the, the big story was that communism had hit a cul-de-sac. It had come to an end of its competitive freedom to operate in the world. And the USSR ceased to be a superpower. Indeed, it ceased to exist. Now, we've been asked to look at general questions. And my picture so far has indicated that communism was an impossibilist long-term project. The fact is, however, that one communist state, one great communist state, still exists in China. And uh, a mixture of communist authoritarianism plus a, f a very, very wild free market capitalism has been experimented with in China in a way that never happened in, in uh, the USSR. This was something that Gorbachev was never going to uh, attempt to do. And unlike in the USSR, Chinese have had the benefit of foreign investment and foreign technology so that they have been able to make moves towards economic superpower uh, status. We live in a very dangerous point of world history. We do not know <coughs> what will happen if and when Chinese economic success uh, falters. If um, uh, we look at what is happening at the moment, it's pretty clear that when the Chinese leadership faces difficulties, it turns increasingly to nationalism. And there is a danger of war uh, in the uh, Pacific. And one of the great internal dangers, it seems to me, of communism is the absence of institutional restraints on the decisions of the leadership. This is inherent in the political structure of communism. So that what might appear to be a success for at least one great communist state may be a success that the rest of the world is going to rue, regret, and suffer for. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, Leonid, you're next. This is Leonid Barotkin, uh, uh, yeah, whom most of you know uh, is at Moscow State University and the author of many books, a corresponding member of the Academy of Sciences, and uh, creator of a, a, a very important 
group in economic history that uses uh, quantitative methods. Um, thanks, Lini, for coming. Thank you. Uh, Distinguished colleagues, I'll be speaking in Russian, and I would like to say that uh, my commentaries in certain way are related to the previous speech. And I would like to elaborate the following questions. What was forerunner of revolution if there was forerunner of revolution? How did life standards of population changed of the empire in the years preceding the war? And what's most important in the years of war? How much factor of material state of most of the population of empire? How much this factor played substantial role in upcoming revolution? And what are the contradictory situations in today's historiography in terms of assessment of these indicators of dynamics of the wealth of people? We see that really they're quite contradictory, they're different, they differed in the past and still differ today, and really there is a problem of having more steady assessment of these dynamics. First of all, today, when we see active discussion regarding 1917 in the magazines and in student audi audi audiences and on the top level, we oftentimes see discussion with such statement. What would happen if in this point this decision was made and if the events went different path, although 95% I think share this popular point of view that history doesn't know if this discussion, starting discussion, shows that those people who don't share this point of view, this maxima, they, however, in their the argumentation, they come to the crossroads and ask question, what would happen if we will come back to this question? But for now, I would like to very briefly to tell you that all research of the recent 20 years dedicated to how much life standard changed in the years of pre-revolutionary industrialization, say, since 1870 till the beginning of the First World War. All research really demonstrates that life standard was improving, not quickly, not substantially, but it was improving. For instance, the salary of the workers, it was improving in different measures. We, in our Center of Economic History, conducted several projects whereby we studied archives of large enterprises such as textile, metal processing, mining in the years of this 25 industrial push of Russia. At the level of large plants where we have data on salary on individual level it is clear that it's growing substantially in, in nominal numbers. As for real, I'll tell you separately, it's also growing, but not so much. If we take official data, such as factory and plant statistics that provides information about salaries in the sectors, in production industry, it grows substantially from 180 rubles per year in 90s of the 19th century up to 260 rubles the annual salary per one worker before the first world war as to the life of the peasants of course when we talk about huge country that occupies one-sixth of the dry land where development is not 
consistent such integral indicators make situation look rough you need to look at the industrial uh, sectoral situation but mostly they show improvement not very much but still improvement of life standards of the peasants and although population grows very quickly about three million per year during that those, those years but let's say the yield grew by the factor of two during that period such integrated uh, assessment were made by Andrei Markevich who is present here and his colleagues from England such as Mark Harrison they give much more than uh, I just mentioned but they show quite positive indicators of this economic growth that of course impacted the level of uh, life and life standards although differentiation of these assessments are quite big considering territory industries yes this development was quite contradictory yes there were strikes quite active there was revolution of 1905 but here we should not direct link with the indicators of material life standard level several years ago I was in Japan and um, I bought publication Japan 1913 it was at the outdoor market I found data that Japan of 1913 the average length of working day was 13 and a half and 14 hours at the same time in Russia it was nine and nine and a half hours number of the f time of 30 in a year in Russia industrial workers had 100 free days although strikes were more active than in Japan with difficult tough exploitation in Japan almost no workers movement Japan doesn't experience shakes why the different explanations but I just like to at attract your attention that the point of view that that how difficult life of workers were how in Russia in international comparison doesn't always find confirmation now as to yes and I should add that according to the estimates made in the publication of Kakin Gauss in 90s the assessments made by Paul Gregory and other specialists the average growth rate of industry in 25 years before first world war was 6.6 percent we don't know country at that time such as 25 years before 13th year that would have 6% of growth per year this shows that country was developing in industrial sense quite intensively although I'll repeat there's contradictions uh, there were problems but still it was developing and we know that there are different statements such as the evolution was not forecasted by the 13th year it was successful year good outlook as to three years of war here as I mentioned there are so many different valuations in the 17th year and the first year of after 17th leading economists of Russia assessed very differently the currency of war and change of life standards and in particular Prokopovich believed that growth rate of salary was faster than the inflation pretty much the same point of view was from Tverdokhlebov famous economist in 17th year he was editor-in-chief of the magazine the messenger of industry at the same time there were assessments of different kind 
and some dominating saying that salary was growing at lesser rate than prices and life standard in this sense was worsening. Here, in order to make such statements, we, for instance, have to have consent indicator of inflation. We use different indicators, they provide different assessments, but if we enter the field of international rela comparison with any any deviations, the index of inflation in other fighting countries, the growth rate of salary and growth rate of inflation were not strongly seriously different from Russia. Russia is not extraordinary, is not outstanding against the other countries. Similar indicators of the salary growth rate and inflation rate that was ahead. And when we read people of that time, they speak about crazy inflation by the 16th year but with different assessments is between 200 to 280 percent i mean inflation 280 percent is maximum by the 16th year many of us lived through the period when inflation was thousand percent two thousand percent per annum and 200 percent is nothing special so against the backdrop of uh, pre-revolutionary history when inflation was roughly 35 percent on average one percent per annum of course these were ex outstanding numbers i'm finishing and i'd like to say that number of questions posed they need to be elaborated in my view speaking about in inevitability of revolution i wouldn't say so we know well different points of view. The last minute, Trotsky said that if me and Lenin in October of the 17th were not in Petrograd, like uh, provisional government arrest us, then there were not revolution. Lenin in 17th year in his favorite Switzerland said, we old people will not hear the thunder of revolution. And you can have many quotations saying that leaders of revolution did not believe that it's in inevitable and finishing by the phrase of Lenin saying yesterday was late before the 25th October tomorrow tomorrow will be late meaning that next year will be convention of Soviets and the parties with 20 percent support it's senseless to I don't mean that I believe that revolution is inevitable there were crossroads, they need analysis and the fact of material state and food supply need to be studied. I think we should stay with the Russian Revolution before moving to the two participants who have a comparative and, and um, per se, is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Professor Boldakov, I think that um, uh, the director Vladimir Budakov, chief research fellow of the research of the History Institute, one of the best specialists of the 17th year revolution. Thank you, colleagues. First of all, I need to agree I should agree with the point of view that we should uh, stop dividing 17th year as the two revolutions, such as February Revolution and October Revolution. For me, revolution as much as for Lenin, that's the question of power, not in, by the way, the context that Lenin had, 
but I understand this process quite simply. There was weak power of Nicholas II. There was weak power of Alexander Kerensky. And naturally, there was strong power of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. But because of this, we have several questions. Professor Orlovsky already pointed out that uh, humongous influence was the organization of power, such as the administration of the process. This is really so. In, in Nicholas II, we see not only weak power. This power didn't control anything in February of the 17th. As for Kerensky power, the same happened by October 17th year. I'd like to point out to you one more thing. Talking about weakness of power, we should consider not only military and the force, like Professor Service said, we need to consider also degree of the trust of power, if you want, Psych psychiatric content of the power. Things were quite bad, that's a matter of fact. And based on this, Considering this point, of course, all the history of the 17th year will be not just st story of uh, different political parties and electoral campaigns, but history of the collapse of power. In this sense, of course, appearance of Bolsheviks was quite reasonable. I'd like to point out another thing. Professor Brodkin absolutely correct when he says that life standards of workers and peasants stayed direct honestly during First World War, Russian peasants became rich. It's fact. As for the workers, the workers' salary grew, inflation was not high. At least the state of the workers and the urban population in Russia cannot be compared to what happened in Germany when people who died from hunger, and they mentioned fantastic number of 800,000 who died from hunger in 1916th and 17th. That's matter of fact, in Russia nothing similar happened as to the organization of the supply. Things were quite bad, no doubts about this. And this commotion, this difficulty, that happened everywhere. Corruption, by the way, that was spoken about by everyone. It's a matter of fact, a lot was stolen and uh, much was stolen. This undermined trust towards the power. I'd like to point out some objective prerequisites to the revolution. You see, there will not be enough always. It doesn't matter how much work is or the female worker received. The question, how did they feel their position? Really, workers used to having life standard growing, that the salary was growing. But what will workers say if there is serious drop of the salary? I think that reaction will be negative. But, uh, thinking that workers in 17th year only thought how to overturn the provisional government, I think it's absolutely incorrect. The thing is that, first of all, the key problem they had before them is the problem of physical survival. In this sense, they were ready to collaborate with the capitalists, the same as just in the battlefield, soldiers were ready to collaborate with the officers. There was problem of survival in the full sense of this word. Because of this, I'd like to point out one more thing. It is accepted here that all national movements of the 17th had separatist nature. Let me assure you that it's not true. The same tendency was here, the principle of survival. If the state, if the former empires didn't provide survival of ethnos, then the process of eth ethnic isolation 
denial, repulse that power cannot tolerate, meaning we will survive on our own. And the last thing I'd like to point out, because my time is coming to the end, I'd like to... Possibly this is, uh, I think, is uh, one of the very important points, actually. Uh, Professor Service, uh, my old friend, uh, used to say that in 1917 uh, we uh, there was a revolution of the new type. Uh, on the one hand, uh, formally speaking, it was a, an entirely new revolution under socialist slogans. On the other hand, it was a really archaic revolution due to certain utopian uh, concepts uh, that uh, Robert Service uh, was referring to. Uh, that is very important. You, we should not uh, ignore the fact that 83% of Russia's population uh, were uh, peasants. Uh, uh, as for peasant mentality, the mindset, it actually uh, was characteristic, was typical of the major portion of the entire population. You shouldn't forget about the urban population. So precisely the combination of this mental archaic features and the newest socialist doctrines uh, engendered uh, that social, tremendous social explosion. And the last thing I wanted to uh, draw your attention to uh, the in recent time uh, we've heard quite often that uh, the revolution is uh, the result of a conspiracy, evil forces, uh, actions and so on and so forth. People were saying similar things in 1970 quite much. But uh, you should not forget one simple thing. As for the February revolution, uh, we should focus not on how the power was overthrown, but uh, we should focus on the reaction towards uh, the uh, um, dethronement of uh, Nicholas II. You can't imagine that people were so overjoyed with that. You, it's hard to imagine why people were so imagined. And the situation was quite different in October 1917. People were mostly confused uh, uh, at that time, especially workers were quite uh, indifferent and passive towards the Bolshevist uh, uh, coup d'etat. On the other hand, uh, uh, some people were probably glad, but uh, the peasants uh, were expecting what they were, were supposed to receive as a result of this coup. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, um, uh, it would be naive to call this revolution proletarian revolution as uh, we used to call it in Soviet time, whatever uh, political forces may say at this point. And uh, also, I think that uh, now, a hundred years on, we should uh, take a different view on the revolution. Uh, well, talking about the direct uh, perception, impressions of um, sensitive people such as uh, writers, uh, um, artists and so on and so forth, they saw it as a, um, as a kind of an uprising, uh, a kind of a rebellious event. Um, uh, but uh, we should not, uh, we should look at this not as a political event, but we should look at it from the uh, socio-psychological uh, viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vladimir Prokhorovich. Uh, uh, would like to give the floor to Andrei Markevich. Moscow uh, School of Economics. Uh, good morning. It's not the Moscow School of Economics. It's a Russian economic school. These are different institutions. Um, thank you for this opportunity to participate in this uh, panel uh, discussion. Let me uh, follow up on the economic aspects of the Russian uh, Revolution, uh, of the Russian 1917 Revolution, both on the causes um, that Leonid Ospich uh, was uh, referred to, and also the economic uh, consequences of the uh, 1917 Revolution. From what I've heard uh, from uh, our colleagues, uh, I see a, a paradoxical uh, picture. The living standards are grow were growing while the revolution happened. 
um, uh, well, actually, I also contributed to the same viewpoint, uh, but this it was a kind of a paradox. Uh, so what were the real reasons behind this, uh, the real causes of the revolution? So the political explanations uh, may be in store, but I would like to remain on economic ground, uh, touching upon two aspects that we haven't mentioned so far. So the first aspect is related to probably uh, to uh, the distribution of this uh, pie, uh, the uh, gross economic product uh, in the Russian Empire, and the conflicts related to the uh, distribution of uh, GDP uh, uh, of the country. I think uh, that's probably a kind of a starting point, a reference point. Uh, from which we can proceed and uh, to study this uh, phenomenon further, but because talking about the Stolypian reforms, which can uh, uh, facilitate uh, growth in agriculture and probably aggravated conflicts in the meantime around the Russian in the Russian countryside, um, in terms of uh, land uh, uh, allocations, uh, land distribution between peasants uh, and uh, peasants and landowners. So I think that's uh, quite an important aspect that we need to uh, focus on uh, in the future and that requires more detailed uh, uh, studies. Uh, the second economic aspect, uh, um, talking about the causes of the Russian Revolution, as uh, colleagues uh, were just saying, that it's not quite clear what um, happened uh, to the living standards during the wartime. But at this point, I would rather uh disagree on that point uh, because at that time uh, it wasn't a catastrophic uh, decline but still there was a decline in economic output and uh, if you look at the uh, living standards and we talk uh, just uh, if we uh, discard uh, the sectors that worked uh, the military sectors of the economy the inflation like 80 uh, percent you know the uh, um, the average uh, living standards of a uh, man, uh, of an average man, uh, well, was of course uh, uh, much lower during the war time. As for the peasantry, I would disagree with Professor Kmokmakov because the um, um, that uh, their living standards were growing at the, during wartime. So the overall statistics of the agriculture uh, testify to the fact that it was a general decline in general. Well, we can uh, look at different uh, groups of uh, landowners and peasants, of course, but some, maybe some of the farmers uh, actually uh, got some benefits from that, but nevertheless, still talking about the uh, land distribution and the economic aspects, the economic difficulties caused by war and economic collapse of the Russian economy by 1917. It's an important aspect, economic aspect, economic, one of the important economic reasons of the Russian Revolution. So uh, uh, when we discuss this paradox, uh, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, then when the living standards were growing, and then the revolution took place. So it's still, we, if you look at the dynamics, the picture would be quite different. Now, talking about the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, the long-term aftermath of the Russian uh, Revolution, this subject uh, is also requires further uh, study and uh, more uh, research. And, and uh, I think that we can subdivide them into immediate and long term, but of course the economy dropped uh, more than twice. Uh, we we have these figures. We uh, we've got all the statistics, uh, and I think in this uh, respect we we do have a consensus. But talking about the longer term prospects, we see a more interesting picture because if you look at the dynamics of the economic development in the Russian Empire. Uh, and the Soviet Union throughout the 20th century, there is one uh, dominating trend. Well, there are certain, uh, of course, deviations, uh, uh, such as the hunger uh, in 1932, 33, the economic shock, uh, shocks uh, in the 20s, but the development of the economy, the, the, the key trend is was about 2% GDP per capita growth per year. 2% uh, per capita growth. 
so I think that's one of the questions related to the Russian Revolution. What Russian Revolution actually did uh, in terms of long-term economic development of the country? So, proceeding from a simple premise, a simple uh, overall general dynamics per capita figures, though the answer is uh, quite plain, nothing. It has done nothing. So uh, it might be look very naive, but we need to look further and to study it more thoroughly, of course, because we study, we must think within uh, the framework of uh, these scenarios that Leonid Osifovich was referring to, what would have happened if it, uh, certain events had not taken place. So the uh, reverse uh, trend, uh, uh, nothing would testify to the fact that the, the trend would have been the same uh, had the revolution not happened. And um, so that here are the economic aspects that will require further discussion and further uh, work uh, of economists and historians. Thank you. Uh, Carol for organizing the panel. Thank you to Ranipa for the hospitality and thank you very much to the Gaidar Forum for the invitation to come today. And thank you all very much for coming along on what for me is quite a cold morning, but I understand from my wonderful student helpers is actually uh, positively spring-like in, in how mild it is. Um, it's the second time that I've been to Moscow. The first time was in an actual spring of April 1990. Uh, and I was on a school trip in my last year of school as part of a comparative politics course that was examining the different systems of governance in the United States and the Soviet Union. And I mention that not uh, out of reasons of personal nostalgia, although that's part of it, uh, for two actual substantive reasons. The first is that the whole notion of a comparative politics course that's comparing the United States and the Soviet Union is only made possible by the Bolshevik Revolution by 1917 and the American Revolution 140 years previously. Why? Because they established rival visions of modernity, rival ways of organizing not just uh, polities, but uh, rival forms of, of economic interaction and alternative forms of cultural order. So 1917, for me, marks the start of a systemic bipolar conflict that is systemic in the sense that it's at once geopolitical, economic, and cultural. It's those things simultaneously. And that's what I was studying on the course, and that's what I came to Moscow to see. Uh, the second reason why I mention uh, the trip to Moscow is that if 1917 represented the start of the bipolar contest between the US and the Soviet Union, the trip in April 1990 was in some ways the midpoint that marked its end. Uh, the chairman mentioned that the Civil War of 1921 was the end of the 1917 revolution, and that's certainly right in the short term. But in the longer historical perspective, then the end of the 1917 revolution is, is somewhere between 1989 and 19. 91. Perhaps 1989 is the February and 1991 is the October, I'm not sure. But I was here at some kind of midpoint between the two. And at the time, some of what was going on was obvious. The shifting sands of Central and Eastern Europe were already uh, becoming clear to see. The dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 was certainly much harder to see. Uh, I certainly didn't see it at the time as an 18-year-old, although perhaps the queues around the block at McDonald's in Pushkinsky Square were more portentous than they appeared at the time. In thinking about these dates uh, from a more world historical vantage point, what do we see? I think everyone agrees, or at least almost everyone agrees, I certainly would, that 1989, 1991, and 1917 are dates of world historical significance. But where the debate is, is about why they're significant. What do they add up to? What are their principal legacies? And this is clearly contested. If you think about it, it's clearly something that changes over time in terms of their assessment. If you think about 1989 and 1991, at the time they appeared as triumphant assertions of the virtues of Western governance, Western markets, and so on. And from the vantage point of 2017, I think that assessment and those virtues are in some doubt. They're at least contestable. So perhaps it's too early to tell about the assessment of 1989 and 1991 as world historical dates, but surely we can say something about the legacies of 1917. And what I want to do in the rest of the time allotted to me this morning is talk about two legacies 
of 1917 when it comes to understanding revolutions, and it builds upon the points that our previous speakers have made, at least in part. The first relates to the, what 1917 meant for the, for the notion of revolution, this idea of revolution with a capital R, as Bob Service put it. The second to its principal mode of organization, the Vanguard Party. So first, what was the influence of 1917, February and October, on the character of revolution? And I think of the Bolshevik Revolution as the events of 1917 as a kind of revolution 2.0, that it's sandwiched between the revolution 1.0, that the political revolutions um, that's high point is the Atlantic revolutions of the late 18th, early 19th centuries, America, France, Haiti, other places in the broader Atlantic space, and then more contemporary forms of revolution which I associate with 1989, and then the events of the post-Cold War period, which I want to call Revolution 3.0. And I'll come back to 3.0 in a moment, but how was the Bolshevik model some kind of 2.0? How did it both build upon Revolution 1.0, the political revolutions of the 19th century, and also do something new? Well, I think the first point of differentiation is the shift in understanding of revolutions, not just as, as, as uh, attempts to do something about political subjugation and political equality, but the shift to the terrain of class struggle. So to think about revolutions as primarily about shifting forms of, of economic interaction, and that that itself would produce great political and cultural, maybe even psychological, transformations uh, in their place. So the shift is from political subjugation to economic subjugation, or from political equality to economic equality. And that really means a shift from political revolutions to social revolutions. So the political revolutions I would define as extra constitutional transformations of the state. And I think of them as, as being captured by the Atlantic revolutions, the springtime of nations in 1848 in Europe, perhaps the constitutional revolutions of the early part of the 20th century here in Russia, also uh, in Iran, Persia, the Ottoman Empire, China, a few years later in Mexico. But the Bolshevik Revolution was a new model of revolution. It was a social revolution. And it was that model of simultaneous economic, political, and cultural transformation that had its later doppelgangers in China, in Cuba, Algeria, Vietnam, Nicaragua, and elsewhere. Now, they didn't always succeed in that transformation, but that was the attempt. That was the whole notion and meaning and ideology of revolution that those particular states underwent. And I think that notion of social revolution was the predominant form of revolution between 1917 and 1989. In fact, so powerful was its pull that the whole notion and meaning of revolution became captured by this notion of dramatic, irreversible, systemic transformation, revolution with a capital R. But there were other meanings of revolution that were submerged by the Bolshevik Revolution and its success in capturing or singularizing the meaning of revolution itself. Most prominent was this strand of political revolution that survived into the 20th century, and particularly its melding with nonviolent forms of protest. And here I have in mind the 1968 revolutions in Europe, as well as various civil resistance movements in South Asia, North America, and parts of Europe. Now, somewhat surprisingly to me at least, these two submerged strands of revolution, the notion of political revolution from the 19th century, this notion of nonviolent protest that we get from the 20th century, come together most powerfully in Iran in 1917, 1979. It's a revolution that now we remember as being violent and authoritarian, and it certainly was in terms of its outcomes, but it wasn't in terms of its origins. In origins, there was a 16-month, largely peaceful, nonviolent, huge, movement of popular protest leading up to the Shah's exile in January 1979, where a substantial portion of Iranian society took part in these protests. Now, these forces were overtaken uh, by radical Shia forces after the revolution. They were defeated in violent fashion. But their tactics in terms of peaceful protest, their scale, the largest such movements in world history at the time, perhaps still so today, and their goals to establish a republic mark an, I think, very interesting way station between Revolution 2.0, the Bolshevik model, and Revolution 3.0, this merging of political revolution with nonviolent protest. So crucial here is to note the second legacy of the Bolshevik Revolution that I want to focus on, the Vanguard Party. Now, other people have talked about how unexpected uh, the events of 1917 were, and they certainly were, 
Lenin famously claimed that the Bolsheviks had succeeded only because history had stopped making sense. Uh, Antonio Gramsci, uh, the Italian Marxian thinker, quipped that the 1917 revolution was a revolution against Karl Marx's capital, because none of the objective conditions that Marx thought a revolution required were present in Russia in 1917. And Hannah Arendt famously remarked that the Bolsheviks hadn't made the revolution, they'd simply found power lying apparently unwanted in the street and picked it up. But in one crucial respect, they were certainly lucky, but in one crucial respect, the Bolsheviks did make the 1917 revolution. The notion of the vanguard party, committed, disciplined, hierarchical, was, as Lenin put it, the brain of the revolutionary movement. And Lenin's argument that agitation, propaganda, and education allied to ruthless efficiency, discipline, and organization could not just direct a revolution, but also create it. There was a constructive role for a revolutionary party, even in inhospitable and unlikely circumstances like those in Russia in 1917. And it's that notion of the creative capacities of the vanguard party that's picked up and later adapted to local circumstances by Mao, Castro, Ben Bella, Ortega, and others later in the century. But as it traveled from its original source here in Russia in 1917, so the notion of the vanguard party met the same fate as the Bolshevik model of social revolution itself. It was first challenged by alternative revolutionary currents, and then I think that it was buried by them. So in 1989 and 2011, the emergence of vanguard parties, nor do we see a notional meaning of revolution as fundamentally one of social revolution. Rather, we get vast revolutionary coalitions, some matching the scale of those in Iran in 1979, all espousing a notion of horizontal rather than vertical organization, all thinking about issues of political equality and political justice rather than economic justice or even social justice. Those movements in many instances precisely legitimize themselves against the notion of a social revolution and against the notion of the Leninist Revolutionary Party. So this gets at the question that Carol posed and that I'll finish with. To what extent was the Bolshevik model a model for later revolutionaries? It certainly was a model for revolutionaries throughout the 20th century, but I would argue that it is certainly not one now, except as the antithesis of a revolutionary movement or as uh, the idea of what a revolution should be legitimated through and should seek to do, notwithstanding China's idiosyncratic experiment that Bob Service outlined. So Revolution 2.0, with one or two exceptions that we might want to discuss, has, I think, been confined to the dustbin of history. And by dustbin here, I don't mean recycling, I mean landfill. I think it's gone and it's gone for good. Um, what we have in its place is a kind of emergent Revolution 3.0, a model focused on political rather than social transformation, nonviolent in its ethos, decentralized rather than hierarchical in its organization, a majoritarian mass participatory movement rather than one that's of a minority or hierarchically organized. Now, normatively, it's easy to see the appeal of such movements and why so many people participate in them, even if they often participate from the comfort and safety of their own sofas. Substantively, it's just as easy to see their weaknesses, a failure to follow the ousting of the old regime with a coherent political program, a lack of a concerted plan of economic transformation, little sense of what should come after a successful revolution? What do you do when the despot leaves? Not least because there is a lack of a vanguard organization that can deliver, that can turn a revolutionary movement into a revolutionary party of state transformation. And this leaves those kind of movements, Revolution 3.0, open to outmaneuvering by old politics, by vested interests, and so on. And even when they succeed, these movements often suffer from a sense of unmet expectations. And there's where we return to the mixed legacies of 1989, 1991, and more recently 2011, but that's something for another discussion. What have I done? Do we have a mic? Do we have a mic? Here. Okay, why don't you give me a mic? Okay, I would, I would speak very briefly, actually, because we have gone over time. I, um, can you just go for the title? Um, 
uh, there are two parts of my presentation, but since I will have the master class this afternoon, I'm not going really to talk about the first part at all because clearly there is no time. The two parts are the following. In, uh, uh, let me give you a little bit of a background. In the <clears throat> discussions about inequality, rising inequality today, we have had to basically revise, also because we have many more data about inequality in the past, to look actually at the trends of inequality in the past. Now, it has emerged, actually, maybe you can go a little bit further until you get, uh, yeah, maybe this is, it has emerged that actually when you look at the rich countries, so I will come to Russia in a moment, but when you look at the Western countries, you have the, what I call in my book, of which I will talk this afternoon, the first wave of Kuznets rising inequality, which actually gets broken around the time of the World War I. And then there was a, from 1914 or 1918, there was a, a significant decline in inequality in practically all major countries, and actually other countries, countries that became later socialists as well, countries like uh, uh, Turkey, countries like uh, Korea, and so on. And that trend, that actually wave, then ends in 1980, after which we have quasi-universal increase in inequality. So basically, we have a wave of what I call the Kuznets wave in sort of relationship or honor of Simon Kuznets, who was the first one to have talked about the curve, because he didn't talk about the waves. But I think we can talk about the waves. So what's the relationship with that to the Russian Revolution? There is first relationship about the causes which brought the World War I, which broke essentially the first wave of increasing inequality. So I will not talk about that, but I just want to mention that, of course, the wars have now really become, uh, how should I say, they have now a much bigger role in our stud studies of inequality as equalizers. And this is what I call the, bin, the malign forces of economic equalization. You can have benign forces like mass education, technological change, uh, trade union movements. These are the benign forces. But you can have a malign force, which historically, and that's also another part in my book, historically was epidemics. Because epidemics would kill lots of people, they would increase the wage rate of those who had remained, and actually inequality would go down. Another malign force of equalization was wars. Revolution was yet another malign force of equalization. So then, that's where the, uh, the World War I comes into the play, because there I actually use what I, Essentially, I go back to, to Hobson, Lenin, and Max Weber. Max Weber is not known, actually, but he basically had a theory, which maybe you can go a little bit further, just to sort of give a feeling of what is, you know, you can skip all of this, of what is where you come to the definition of, you go, go. Uh, when you come to the definition of uh, uh, Hobson's idea, basically. Uh, this is the basic idea. It's actually now we're working on that uh, uh, empirically. So the basic idea is that <clears throat> goes back to John Hobson. So you have, if you have what we call maldistribution of income in rich countries, meaning that really you have very high concentration of income in the hands of relatively few people. There is lack of aggregate demand domestically, so what you need, this is classical theory of imperialism, what you need, you need actually other countries to invest that. As you invest that, mo that money in other countries, you need to have political control over those countries because otherwise your investments can be taken over from you. Actually, Max Weber, as I said, is it's absolutely unknown, but Max Weber in society and economy says exactly the same thing. So this is the economic basis of imperialism, which is driven by domestic inequality in income. And then... Uh, the, the sort of essential imperialism is seen as coming from inequality, and that's why I call it the endogenous theory of imperialism, because it is inbuilt in domestic structure and then has an impact internationally. So if you go to the next, now we just want to, sh to show you, uh, uh, to a, uh, want to go to a graph. There are really three points here. 
that we want empirically to sort of study. The first, did countries with higher domestic inequality have more foreign investments? Because that's exactly the corollary of, uh, of uh, Hobson's idea. The next one, of course, we will find, as of course, as, uh, Lenin had this idea as well. Then the second one, did foreign assets generate a net positive surplus yield over domestic assets? That's very interesting because it comes under two different sort of uh, stories. You know, one story is that the lack of aggregate demand that Hobson had. Another story is Marx's story that was taken over by Lenin is that there was this sort of a secular decline in the rate of return, as you know, actually, with the organic increase in the, in the um, uh, composition of capital. So basically, you generate less and less, and then you have to find new sources. So this is actually empirical data. We have it. Uh, for uh, France, UK, and Germany. You see in the case of UK and Germany, it's maybe not very clear, but if it's above zero, that means the foreign assets on average yield you more. In the case of UK, it's very interesting, it's actually the highest assets were known in colonies, the returns were known in colonies, because UK data are quite good. You have assets which are in colonies, you can assets which are in other countries, so, and you, have also, you can also distinguish between countries which were dominions like, uh, like Canada, Canada and, um, and uh, uh, South Africa and Australia from the others. Germany the same, the blue line is an odd man out, it's France with very cyclical returns. But what is interesting about France is really mostly bonds. And of course Russia played quite a role in that respect because of course as you know France had large investments in Russia. So the third point that we want to look is, is there then a relationship between military expenditures and the number of the military pair you know, per capita in a country and foreign investments. And there actually, this is actually, I think, the least controversial we find fairly strong, which is all controlled by country specifics, but we find fairly strong relationship between sort of militarism and uh, ownership of foreign assets. And then, uh, just to finish with this whole story, you can of course argue that nowadays we are really in some way similar situation in a different. The, the similarity is that of course we have, for the first time now, we are back at the peak of what was before 1914 in terms of the amounts of foreign uh, assets, I mean assets held by foreigners in countries which are obviously not their own. So we are actually gone beyond the point of 1914, so we have more of it. But we have the entire architecture of the world, which is, you know, MIGA, which protects foreign investments, the World Trade Organization and all of that, which we didn't have in 1914. So actually, to be very brutal, in 1914, in order to protect your assets, you had actually to control that territory. And you had to control that government, and you would have to make sure that nobody can steal that from you. So that's the first part, and I will not, obviously, maybe I'm already too long. Now, let me just finish with the part uh, with, which deals now with revolutions, and I'm glad that you mentioned several revolutions there and this part comes here it's actually it, the idea is the following uh, this is the social table from 1904 uh, based on nothing here in Lindert it was for the European Russia so I just want to show you how the social tables look because I'll show in a graph the social tables for about 30 40 countries for which we don't have household survey but we have tables which are often done based on censuses which list key social classes and their incomes. So now what is interesting here, as you can see, this is the number for Russia 1904, European Russia. And European Russia this is now set in the following framework. If you look at this uh, f uh, thick line, this is what is called inequality possibility frontier. Uh, what is on the vertical axis is the Gini number, which is the level of inequality that the country has, and the GDP per capita is on the horizontal axis. So in principle, and you see there is really lots of countries, this is going back to actually Byzantine and Roman Empire, their data for that, and it goes all the way to actually not, it was all pre-modern society. So it basically ends with, I think, the latest number there is from the 1920s, India. Now, what is interesting there is that if you have very poor society, uh, 
then the, the surplus is relatively poor, uh, relatively small. So it's actually, you cannot have an inequality which is 100, which is the maximum Gini coefficient, simply because if everybody has to survive, the king who is alone there cannot really take very much money. So you actually see only very poor societies being, uh, having their dots, these are the years and the dots, on the black line. Now, the, th the four red dots are the Russian Revolution, uh, the Glorious Revolution in the UK, US, you know, the Independence and Revolution, and the French Revolution. Now, I will sh you already see there, the only of the four, because the Russian genie that was calculated in 1904 is not particularly high. It's about 35 genie points. Actually, it's lower than today's genie in Russia. And uh, the only one which actually is close to that uh, line, black line, is the French Revolution. And this is my last slide. So then I, uh, I'm sorry, like one after that. Uh, then, oh, sorry, it was over. Uh, sorry for, if you can go back to the last one. Uh, so then you can actually put in the same framework all these large revolutions. I think this was the last one, uh, the elusive last slide. Let's do this. So, yeah, let's stop here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's one, that's one. So actually, what you do there, you put it all within the same framework. You're saying, what was the, how much of the maximum inequality there existed prior to the revolution? As you can see, French comes to something like almost 85% of maximum inequality. So in other words, the level of inequality or the level of extraction of the surplus by the elites was extremely strong. As you can see, American and English are also relatively strong because the countries were relatively poor. But then the Russian is not out of the ordinary. So in other words, going back to the whole discussion about inequality, inequality level in 1904, if we believe that's the same one as in 1914, was not very, ha very uh, been high in Russia, or certainly not as high compared to the French one. And then finally, I put the three modern revolutions, which is the Iranian Revolution 1979, and the Soviet Revolution 1990, and the Egyptian in 2011. Now, what happens there is that, of course, the levels are, of course, even lower because simply the surplus has become much bigger because the countries have become richer. So in the last point is that red line, then you actually can adjust by not talking about the surplus being only the surplus above the, the minimum subsistence, but you actually adjust for the level of expected level of income that people sort of would have uh, at that point in time. And then the situation gets a little bit different. Actually, you can see the Iranian then becomes actually uh, more extractive than it would look otherwise, but the rankings really do not change. The bottom line of that, I think that actually, if we take 1904 data for Russia, if we believe that actually the situation 1914 was similar, that was in terms of distribution to 1904, we do not find in inequality much of an explanatory factor for the revolution itself. So that was uh, the point, whereas, of course, as I argued before, I think we can actually find a story of inequality which would lead to war. So in that sense, it is a very pessimistic story, because for some people who are ultra-pessimist today might actually imagine that that story can, and I hope not, replay today. So thank you very much. Colleagues, we exhausted list of our mandatory discussion members. We had all the people we wanted to make presentations. And there's a uh, discussion between speakers, and I think we can switch to the stage of Q and A and commentaries to the presentations. This is free microphone time. Please pass the microphone on. Thank you very much. I thank all speakers. Please introduce yourself. Valery Bakushev, professor, non-historian. I'm politologist. Today, I would like to talk yet about how to formulate the topic. I'm sorry, I was slightly late, didn't hear the first presentation. 
the past century. I didn't say it's over yet, it still continues. And speaking about 99 years, not about 100 years. So what's the question? My question is rather quite a, a lot of research abroad and in Russia regarding revolution. But still, what's the purpose? I'd like to point out to the historians and for, to those people who continue continue research in modern is quite popular. What's the purpose to have the shooting if we divide not only two colors such as white and black, uh, white and red, and judging by the last presentation that was at the end. It was quite improvised. It's more pleasant to me in order to ask question, and this is the question of Republic. And what was shown on the last slide everything for the sake of having republic. That's why the question is not about the facts, historical facts. What was it? Uh, revolt, revolution, it's separate question. Please don't say that is uh, revolt. There were many revolts in thousand years. It was revolution. It's my inclination. And it's not finished. It diminishes and has new peaks. So here's concrete question. July 1918, something that colleagues spoke. No power, helpless Tsar power and helpless provisional government. The purpose is to declare a republic for the sake of republic. Now the question, what was utopical? The ideas that happened as a result of the socialist revolution. It was French Revolution prepared the notes about this revolution and assess. There were so many people there that went to utopia, to the revolution that took place. I mean, the recent in Africa and Oceania and the constitutions written in those states by metropolis, but we refer them to proto-democratic states, according to statistics of U UN, United Nations statistics. Going back to Russia, I'm asking question. So the topics, in the historical sense, factological sense, a lot's been studied, and many works written would be beneficial, I can say, certainly, that in the recent time are actively involved. There's not so many researchers regarding what did Republic give us, not the form, how much blood was shared, and how much enthusiasm was there, but rather what did Republic give us in all this 99 years till August of 18th year, it's Republic. Building of Republic in Russia continues. I interpret freely in this case, and Vladimir Vladimirovich in his address specified that 100 years of revolution, we need to think. He didn't give conceptual orders, but question the content, what the revolutions one revolution that continues since February 17th. What did it give us? It was first in thousand years. It was first question. So it's constitutionalists, institutionalists. Perhaps they need subject-oriented research in order to think about this question. I would like to to have answer. I'd like to hear our foreign. Uh, visitors. Thank you. I didn't quite understand Isa's question to all members of panel or specifically, but I'd like to remi remind you if you talk about Republic, Russia became Republic on the 1st of September 1917 during provisional government. I'd like to ask questions slightly shorter considering that our time is lacking. Please have any other questions. A lady would like to have to ask question. Hello. Thank you, Oksana Mikhailovna, Sibir Siberian University of Water Transport. I have four questions. Two to Leonid, 
first slightly practical maybe you can hint us some websites because our students can study your works you will give us later second question about economics if we consider history of economics of our country i think you will agree that the role of state was always extremely high and totalitarianism was present except for some periods such 90s of the 20th century so the first question is this what was principal difference in management of economics at the end of 19th century and let's say during period of administrative command system thank you it's a big question i think we need to read a lecture to answer your question it is clear that main difference if we talk about economics of the end of 19th century and administrative command model of the 30th the main difference is that industry and e economy in general is not state economy in the industry state enterprises were 10 percent so there were corporations private industry agriculture of course everything is private so the role of the state was high at the end of 19th century but it was limited to regulation of economic relationships it was limited to let's say investments into railroads it's special subject and a certain economic support of different um, priority sectors of industry but it's not state economy and its main difference and you can speak a lot about the other things but the role of the state in the economics prior to revolution uh, sharply increased during the war years as classical sujet we know that it's confiscation of food and special con con conferences that would set the goals for the industry in years of industry it's really a sharp increase of role of the state not only if in russia of course i'd like to add only that when we talk about the years of war for us today for my colleagues it is clear that is rather abstract to talk about years of war such as 14th till 18th 1914 1916 till the end of 16th year it's one period and it's not catastrophical in terms of economics but since february 17th it's a failure and the state hardly especially the provisional government could hardly do anything but just the numbers we already said by the end of 16th year index of uh, uh, inflation 290 by the end of 17th 1500 it's real failure of financial system loss of control it happens in february and further on till february in principle the same just like another fighting countries and the role of the state is lost in February it's not the on, not the only system but there's catastrophic process not the years of war as usually people say but since February 17th war didn't stop but the failure happened there thank you if you allow me question to Robert oftentimes you use combination of words non-efficiency of Soviet economics about serious problems of the plant economics the failure for me as the citizen of russia this statement uh, is slightly bothers me because no matter what but economics of soviet union uh, restored in two ten years after the world war and the first uh, satellite first hydrogen bomb made in russia during kasigin five-year period we built two thousand plants and two thousand plants in five years when we hear such statement please tell us what parameters you use when you make such statement that soviet economics was failing robert this question to you The question 
I, I think that one of the more interesting things that economic historians could um, engage with uh, uh, in connection with the, the Soviet economy about which the question was asked is the extent to which foreign technology played a part in Stalinist industrialization. There are very, very few works on this subject, either in Russian historiography or in West, Western historiography to this day. And yet it's one of the great distinctions, it seems to me, between Soviet economic development through to the Second World War, when American companies such as Ford played such a big part in the technological uh, advance of the Stalinist economy. And after the Second World War, there was a, a NATO-led embargo in which the Japanese also uh, participated, although they were members of the NATO uh, organization, which to my mind explains the tupic, the cul-de-sac that uh, the USSR arrived in at the beginning of the 1980s. In other words, being cut off from technological, world technological um, progress in so many sectors of industry was a disaster for Soviet economic development. And far too little attention is paid to this as an explanation of what happened in, in the late 1980s in the USSR. I think this contrast between Stalin's ability to import technology and the incapacity of Khrushchev and Brezhnev and uh, even Gorbachev to import technology has a large measure of the explanation for the collapse of the USSR. And ec economic historiography has not really dealt with this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I think our uh, audience should react towards each other. So the last question from the audience, you've asked to, uh, for a long time, and then we'll give the floor uh, to uh, the speakers so they could uh, argue among themselves. Anatoly Nikifor, political psychologist. I'm uh, in interested in uh, studying, I'm studying the political leadership groups, formal and informal. Colleague Lawson, uh, uh, well, you sort of uh, went beyond the framework of 1917 revolution, mentioning certain events in the uh, 89, in the 90s, uh, similar, some events uh, may sound similar uh, to 1917, although they are a bit different in terms of their direction. But in, in, in some respects, they might seem to be similar in terms of organization. But let me ask our uh, American colleagues if we uh, discard political technologies, uh, because we, we, we do face a lot of political technologies when we start the political processes. What, in your opinion, what trends uh, do you see in our society that could lead towards uh, Uh, active, uh, uh, violent uh, change of uh, regime uh, um, in the country, or maybe there are no such forces. Uh, I'm asking our Western colleagues about that because uh, we've seen an avalanche of uh, speculations uh, comparing 1917, uh, 89, uh, and others. Do you have any opinion as experts? Uh, and perhaps uh, if you could share your views on the prospects uh, for the development of the Russian society in this respect. Anyone wants to answer the question? Please, you. Yeah. 
do my best. I'm not going to talk much about Russia because I don't know really anything about it, but I'll try and make um, some broader remarks both about both in relation to the first question and the last question. Um, I can't talk well, uh, about the deep historical uh, dimensions that my colleagues have talked about because uh, Carol said that I'm a sociologist rather than a historian. I'm, I work in history sociology. I'm actually based in an international relations department. So I'm either multidisciplinary or non-disciplinary, depending on your pick. I actually prefer the latter. Um, two things then, one about the impact of 1917 and then the second one about where we might find forces today that are revolutionary. Um, the first thing to say is to reiterate the point about how successful the 1917 model was on its own terms. I think Bob Service talked about regimes that took their inspiration from 1917 at some at their high points controlling a third of the land mass of the world and probably a similar amount of its uh, population. That seems to me to be a remarkable story of success. And that was partly because actually the Bolshevik model was so adaptable to local circumstances. Mao didn't repeat the Leninist model. He made it work for Chinese circumstances. Same with Fidel uh, and Che Guevara in Cuba. The notion of the revolutionary foco was both something drawing on the experience of 1917, but also something that made sense to them in terms of Cuba's uh, local circumstances. So the real skill there is about taking a basic framework or taking a basic understanding of revolution and then making it work in particular historical circumstances. And it wasn't just in, in what we used to call the third world that that model was successful and successfully adapted. It was also in the West. Um, the Black Panthers in the United States, for example, drew their understanding from, from Guevara and uh, Castro's notion of the FOCA. In my own country, the current leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, used to think of himself as a Trotskyist, not the main current of the, the revolutionary regime after 1917, but not an insignificant one, particularly in terms of Western histories of communism in the 20th centuries. So one of the great successes that I didn't talk about is not just that this model was, was successful in its own terms, but also how adaptable it was to local circumstances around the world during the 20th century. In terms of where we stand with it today, uh, in contrast to the, to the first question, I do think it's over. I think that, by and large, the referent point for revolutionaries in the contemporary world, if we think about 1989, 2011, and the various iterations of revolution that we've had in between those two big waves of revolution, then their entire referent point was to be against the Bolshevik model, was to bury the model of 1917, both in terms of its mode of organization and in terms of how it conceived social transformation to take place, the seizure of the state for particular purposes. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't remnants and legacies of the 1917 revolution around. Bob Service talked about China. I mean, that's a particularly idiosyncratic understanding of, of what that country is now going through. But certainly the legitimation for the transformation going on in China still relies on some notion of actual existing state socialism. I'm not sure how much state socialism there is. I think you're right in talk, talking about hyperventilated market capitalism as being the underlying current of the transformative processes within some type of state bureaucratic authoritarian structure. But certainly the formal legitimation for that country is one that remains in that type of broad revolutionary tradition. We might think of other examples, Cuba, although how long that will survive post Fidel, we'll see, etc. One uh, example we haven't talked about that I think is slightly more controversial, but I think has some semblance, at least sociologically, that makes sense, is groups like Daesh. And to what extent they are within the type of uh, revolutionary tradition that we've discussed, at least in part. Their mode of organization is extremely hierarchical, organized, disciplined, centralized. Their idea of what they want to do is to capture a particular type of territorial unit which isn't congruent with existing state borders. They want to brush through and crush existing state borders to proselytize other people. They think they have a vision that is one that is universal. And if not shared by people, then those people can be uh, uh, destroyed by uh, their particular understanding of international order. So they're very different in terms of their formal legitimating ideology, but sociologically in terms of their organization, in terms of, in terms of their aims, I think there actually are some similarities there that we could draw out. On the last question in terms of therefore where are the revolutionary currents in the contemporary world, that's one. Understanding various Islamic movements as revolutionary is not something we often do. And I think that's partly because we think of revolution as somehow necessarily progressive in terms of its 
aims, that we think about it as, as France as 1.0 or America as 1.0 and then Russia as 2.0 is largely progressive in the sense we've understood that over the past two centuries and therefore we don't think about radical authoritarian currents of other forms that are deeply transformatory that share lots of similarities with revolutionary movements in terms of how they organize what their intentions are and what they actually do and I think uh, forms of radical Islam today would be one major current of revolution that's within that tradition that we often overlook. Can I push this along a bit to ask um, Branco what he thinks of Professor Bolakov's uh, remarks? Would you would you mind uh, if you don't if it's not inequality? What is it? <laughs> I mean, he suggested it was enthusiasm and uh, something psychological. I, I would be a brief, actually. I mean, I would I wish it were inequality, actually, because uh, obviously I work with inequality, and many people ask me, actually, could you show, could you argue that inequality more recently is something which is behind the Arab uh, revolutions or behind the Iranian revolution? or was, as I said before, behind the Russian Revolution. I really don't think that we have actually empirically can show that measured inequality is necessarily correlated with uh, revolutions. Um, I think that the issue is very present in China, where actually they talk about the Gini coefficient of 40 as being sort of a turning point. I do think there is some validity to that, because obviously you cannot push inequality you know, endlessly, because at some point, of course, it does have an influence. Uh, and it leads to a breakdown in a societal coordination. But I, I actually, I don't think, I don't see that measured inequality can be generally related easily to the emergence of the revolutionary movements or revolutionary uh, state or society. Now, that does not mean that other things, and people have started working on that, issues of perceptions, uh, issues of unfairness, issues of injustice that are all related to inequality, but may be actually kept under wraps and then suddenly are able to be expressed. And then, of course, like the usual story, that suddenly you always thought that something was wrong, but you never even dared to say that, or you actually never had a change of uh, uh, opportunity to exchange an opinion with somebody else. And then suddenly at one point everybody says the same thing and then you feel validated and then it becomes a social movement. So it could be actually in that sense that, that injustice or inequality of opportunity or things like that which are correlated with inequality in income as measured could be the, 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 the reason. Would you like to summarize or, or would you... Um, yeah, I could do, do, do Yes, just uh, wanted to add a few words. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time. Uh, I have been warned that we have to wrap up this session. I think it is quite interesting, the things that we've heard today. And um, that actually brings us back to the question um, uh, that we are so concerned about. Why revolutions happen? Can we anticipate revolutions? Can we prevent uh, revolutions? And there are, these are very topical questions. And the 100th anniversary of our Russian Revolution uh, makes it possible to speculate uh, over that uh, once again. I think it's quite important that we discuss this in international context because the Russian Revolution, of course, is an event of our Russian history, but it did play a very important role in the global development in the 20th century. And our foreign colleagues have emphasized that as they uh, were talking about the communist bloc. And this impact uh, was uh, so uh, tremendous to an extent that it has even changed the Western world in, in, in itself. I'm referring to uh, Keynes' uh, uh, theory, uh, which is, was one of the aftermaths of uh, the Russian Revolution. I think we are still looking for uh, an answer to the main question. Why this revolution happened? Why did it take place? So the, uh, today's discussion sh uh, has demonstrated that uh, given all these um, uh, discrepancies in the living standards and uh, different views on the uh, living standards, some say that it grew, others say that it dropped, but nevertheless we actually managed to come to a kind of a consensus that allows us to refute the uh, Lenin's idea, uh, who once said that the revolution is the result of 
uh, suffering of the masses of people who suffered and were driven to poverty as a result of war, that this is a kind of social explosion that is a kind of a salvation for the human masses. We see that the, the, this re rhetoric is not supported by these data. But this is another important issue for our questions, that unless it is an economic factor uh, uh, can, that we can consider as a decisive factor, so what factors can be called decisive? What are the main factors behind that? So there are many conspiracy-based theories. I call them cheap theories, uh, uh, where they, um, uh, you know, explain these by means of some internal conspiracy, or uh, some people refer to American traces uh, and other uh, tra and other complicity behind that, but. I do think that there is a kind of a temptation in our society to explain this revolution by these conspiracies staged by our enemies, hostile actions. We should not succumb to this uh, uh, temptation. Well, perhaps we are not capable uh, of answering this question right now, why the revolution, this revolution happened in Russia. And we have to admit the fact that uh, although it's quite a long time, a hundred uh, 100 years is quite a long time, but it's still not sufficient to understand the issue. I think this uh, situation is reminiscent, uh, by analogy with physics, uh, of uh, the nuclear explosion, when the uranium critical mass, as it grows higher and higher, and the phys physicists know uh, uh, the point uh, it, uh, it s is supposed to reach uh, 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 for the explosion to happen. So we historians so far didn't know where this point is, when the social discontent and inequality um, uh, trans uh, can be transformed into an active phase of revolution. So our task is to continue the studies, and I do think that the history of the revolution has not been exhausted, and I do think that we, we there are interesting ideas and new methods of research, so let me uh, extend my gratitude to all the speakers and uh, uh, people who uh, participate in the debate, uh, despite the fact that we've got together not uh, on the best day, the 13th of uh, Friday, 13th uh, of January, Friday, as uh, some people said, it's not the best day, nevertheless, I think we've had a very good discussion. Thanks a lot to everyone and to the organizers of the Gaidar Forum. <laughs>